What's up, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick, a martial arts radio episode 614 with today's guest, Chris Wilder. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here for the show, founder at Whistlekick. I love martial arts, and that's why everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts community worldwide. What does that mean? Well, go to whistlekick.com. That's where you're going to find all the things that we're working on. And one of the things that we work on, we have a store, we have some products. It's one of the ways that we monetize this show and the other things that we do. And if you use the code podcast 15, it's going to save you 15% off anything you find over there. Now the show itself gets its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We bring you two new ones every week and it's all under the heading of connecting, educating, and entertaining you, the traditional martial artists of the world. If the stuff that we do means something to you, if you want to help us out, well, you've got a ton of ways you can do that. You can buy something. You can tell people about what we're doing. You can leave reviews somewhere, anywhere. Anywhere you can think of to leave a review would be great. You could buy a book on Amazon, or you could contribute to the Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Whistlekick. We bring you new exclusive content on Patreon each and every month, and depending on how much you contribute, that impacts what you get access to. You're never going to find the stuff that's on Patreon anywhere else, and well, people seem to like it because they don't stop contributing. Well, today's guest, Chris Wilder, I've known about Chris for a long time. It is completely on me that we haven't had him on the show before. I'm not sure why. It just hasn't happened. But here we are. We're remedying that. And it's an awesome episode. Complete, no, maybe not completely, a little bit different than what we normally do because Chris is a seasoned podcaster himself. And really quickly, he was turning the tables and he's asking me questions. And so I'm trying to ask him questions. And it was a ton of fun. I'm sure that comes through. And if you are watching this, you can see, yeah, it is a video episode. I believe the first video guest episode that we've ever done and very fitting that we would do that here with Chris. So enjoy. Hey, Chris, welcome to Martial Arts Radio. Hey, thanks for uh, having me, man. It's, it's great I, to see you it, again. It's yeah, we, we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun. And what do we really set out as I think that was 595 on our feed when, when we did part two to the whole getting people in to the martial arts school you jason and i and that was that was yeah. a great conversation i had a lot of fun with that no it was it was good it was good uh i liked it nobody stepped on anybody it was nice no which <laughs> is really hard to do you, even if you're not even if you're trying to give people space right and that that's the challenge like okay am i gonna go or are you gonna go it's it's like it's like every group combat drill i've ever done when you're the person in the middle, <laughs> inevitably, you know, if, it, if it's meant to be one person attacks at a time, either nobody yeah. attacks or everybody attacks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, there, there, that, <clears throat> that phenomena, and I've forgotten the name of it, but it's, um, it's a phenomena that happens in groups when there's a crime being committed, if there's a large enough group, the group assumes that somebody's going to right. intervene and then nobody does. And I, I, it has a name. I don't know. What yeah. It is anymore. Yeah. And, and it's a concept I think everybody's familiar with. We've all been part of yeah. that. We've all been in a group where nobody's the de facto, the clear cut leader and nobody steps up and nobody wants to go against the grain. And if everybody's doing nothing for you to do something, you stick out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and hey, I find, uh, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I find those situations to be really potentially dangerous because all mm -hmm. it takes is one person with a little bit of confidence and um, knowledge that that situation is ripe for hijacking. Okay. Talking and, about hijacking. Yeah. And, yeah. and the, the best example I have of that was uh, in high school there, there, I was at a mock government sort of thing that we had like 75 people, hundred people, and with a single statement, I turned it into a riot. There nice. was violence and people were thrown out. Wow. wow. I did not, re and, and it's only, it, it took me a good 15, 20 years to unpack what happened. Oh, that's, that's, uh, yeah, it's I've intense. got a boy state story for you. So. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, I, I've got a question for you. Yeah. Uh, if, if you were going to pick one comedian to live with you guys are bunking together who you, who who are you going to live with for how long a year oh so not bill burr no no that, that is exactly <laughs> i love if, bill if burr was, but i'm not living with him <laughs> 48 hours I'll, I'll do bill burr uh a year no um 
I'm 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 thinking of two. Should Pell because he's going to make me think, and we're going to have amazing conversations. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Kevin Hart because I'm not going to get more done with anybody else than I would with a year around him. Yeah, the guy's got a motor. <sighs> yes, he does. Yeah, yeah. How about you? Yeah, no question. Uh, Dennis Miller, um, mm. you know, uh, because I, I again thinking, and um, I think that uh, he's a he's kind of a you know probably be easy to get along with you know he can be intense oh yeah i know i i love intensity okay. I mean, don't get me wrong but but you know it's like uh hey cha-cha the dishes they need to be done what are you waiting on <laughs> you know it's like okay that's a good I've been called out. yeah you know good I'll, I'll do it you know yeah yeah it'd be that would be it um but then again my, my all-time favorite comedian of ever far and away is is norm mcdonald Mm, Norm McDonald, but why Norm? Uh, Norm has an ability to make a joke that has four or five levels to it. He understands. Uh, he understands negative space. Mm-hmm. Um, he's also the guy when you when you tell him not to do something, he does it. Um, you know, and I like that sort of uh, impish quality about him. Um, he's well read. He's thoughtful. Um, if you get it, you get it, and if you don't get it, he doesn't care. Hmm. You know, he's yeah. a comedian that other professional comedians look up to and respect oh yeah if yeah. you follow the comedy industry there are a handful and what i find interesting is they are not the ones with the most commercial success the name that comes up the most when people talk in that vein is david tell yeah yeah i saw david tell move 20 years ago i think hmm. um and uh man did he crucify the front row <laughs> <laughs> were you in the front row no, no, I wasn't. I was a couple back. Uh, but, uh, you know, there were uh, some people who thought they could compete with him. And uh, no. they couldn't. No, they not couldn't. a chance. Not a chance. Not a chance. Just, just destroyed them. Um, uh, I'll tell you a quick Norm MacDonald story. Um, he was at this uh, casino and we had gone to see him. And uh, at the end of the show, he says, hey, you know, the show's been over for 15 minutes. That light back there, when that flashes, it means I have five. And then when it goes solid, you know, and he goes, and then when it really starts flashing, that means I'm way over. And he goes, see that guy over there? That's Joshua. Joshua, the guy who's waving me. Joshua, come out. He's waving at me to get off the stage. He goes, you know why? It's because they want you rubes back out there on the casino floor. You, you know, they call you rubes. You know, and I'm going, I, I looked over and I go, he, he, he's not coming back. <laughs> you know they're not having him back he didn't and, care and, they're having, and he didn't care he didn't he care didn't care it, yeah there, there's there's something to be said for reaching a level of success where you can do things like that oh yeah yeah and uh you know he he has it. the stories i could go on about norm mcdonald for for hours but you know that's not really why we're here but no it's, it's not but so my style is that when when, when a guest brings things up I figure that tells me something about them. So I'm going to guess that you bring a humorous element into your teaching style. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You bet. Is um, that conscious or is that something that you kind of accidentally fell into? I, it's both because um, uh, I've always, I've always been a wise acre. Mm. Uh, you know, um, I'm the guy that some, and it not, not deliberately so, but there's times that I'll say things that, uh, you know, um, we were, we were at a, uh, uh, convention mm-hmm. and it was in the Midwest and everybody had come in and, and the night before the convention took place, there were the, um, the show Don need on, you know, all of the Don examinations and, um, we're all up there and, um, the, uh, examination board says, uh, they had, head guy says, uh, is there anything we're doing in the organization that uh, you think we should adjust, change, you know? And everybody was like, no, you know, it's really good. It's all good and all this kind of stuff. And so my turn came and I said, hey, you know that thing that got introduced, that thing we're doing, the, the, you know, and it was, uh, I'll spare you all the details. Sure. It had been introduced by the number two guy and he's sitting there on the board and I said, um, I'm not doing that any, anymore. I'm never doing that again. If we do it, I will not participate. 
It is an abject waste of time. Um, it is, no, I'm not doing Were it. Were you that blunt about it? Yeah, yeah, I was that blunt okay. about it. And so we finish, I finished my little dance and uh, I walk over and one of the, one of the uh, de facto leaders of the group kind of stand over there and he walks up to me, puts his hand on my shoulder and he says, you know, I keep pulling you out of the fire. You keep jumping back in. <laughs> and, and afterwards, um, that uh, the guy who had introduced this new aspect of the training and so forth, um, he came walking over to me and I was like, oh, you know, he's got something to say to me and uh, not not wholly unsurprised, you know, sure. and um, and he kind of stopped in front of me and I said, hey, um, I'm not apologizing for what I said. I, I said it and I mean it. And he said and I said, I, I, I know that you might find it offensive, but uh, I'm sticking to it. And he said, you're the only one who told the truth. And, and he said, yeah, and I, res I respect that. And then he walked away. Uh, okay. Yeah. And that was it. And, and, and it was of no concern going forward. There was no retribution or punishments or anything. It was just as we just had a conversation and that was that. And that's a really interesting thing about what we do as martial artists, isn't it? That, that when a higher rank system director, school owner, whatever, implements something, tells us something, it can be really difficult to balance respect with honesty. And I think a lot of people err on the side of, I'm going to be so blindly respectful and not criticize, but that's where the progress comes from. Well, yeah, you know, I'll also say that I've been guilty of being um, too abrupt, thoughtless, and harsh. Mm. You know, I've, I've, I've committed those transgressions when there were better ways to deal with things other than just, you know, spilling it out on the floor. Um, but uh, my tendency is to, is to go that way and to agree with you in that. Um, I am not a blind uh, allegiance kind of guy. Now, uh, one of the things I learned about myself way back in, in high school was when I wrestled and played football. Uh, you know, wrestling, you basically got one or two coaches. In football, you've got a, you know, cadre of them. Um, and uh, I realized that there were some coaches that I respected. And I, um, I would run through a brick wall for them. And then there were other ones that I absolutely just it didn't make any difference if they told me the sky was blue. I wasn't going to believe it. And I wasn't going to listen to them. And uh, one of the coaches, I remember he busted my chops all the time, all the time. Sometimes I had it come and I thought, you know, and other times I didn't. But um, I remember the last game um, we had finished and now I was on my FU tour because, I, you know, there was nothing that could be done. And he came up to me in the locker room and he says, hey, you know, congratulations, you know, you won your last game. And he, and he went to shake my hand. I looked at his hand and I'm standing there in half my pads. And I said, I'm not shaking your hand. I hate your guts. And he looked at me and he said, that's okay. You played hard for me. And he walked away. Well, years later, we run into one another and have a chuckle over it. You know, my immaturity of not understanding that he had his eyes on me because he cared, mm. you know, he was busting my chops because he saw potential and he wanted to make me better. And that if he did not have that interest in me, then, uh, you know, well, th that, that's worse. And that's a lesson that I have carried forever mm. with me. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I use that on a daily basis in the dojo. I'm paying attention to everybody. I'm paying attention to everybody because if I'm not paying attention to them, that means I don't care and mm. I don't want to not care. And does your, your feedback, your motivation, whatever you want to call it, the way you engage, is it the same for everybody or are you, no, you know, no. so, I, I, I would have expected not. Some yeah. people need positive reinforcement. Some people need to be challenged, maybe even borderline on negative reinforcement. 
Is that really the best you can do? I bet you can't kick any higher because you know that's going to get the best results and they're they're going to appreciate it. I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah. It, well, everybody comes in to the school with um, a set of needs, wants, and desires. Hmm. And, and, and goals, even if they're not able to articulate them, that's deep inside them. They're looking for an answer to something. And so my job is to, as quickly as possible, come to some conclusion of what I believe that to be, and then to feed that. Because if I can feed that, then what I can do is I can remove fear and anxiety. And if I can remove fear and anxiety, then I can take you to a new level where you can find that thing that you didn't know existed that was in you. But that's a block. That, that thing that drove them into the dojo, it's not a motivator. It's actually a detriment. And you got to find out what it is mm. and then answer that and do it to the best of your ability. So yeah, every student is a unique, different situation. That's an observation that I, I think my initial reaction is to agree with, but I'd like you to go deeper on it because I've never thought of it before. The reason someone started training is a detriment. This sounds like yeah. something you've considered quite a bit. So can you unpack, unpack that a bit? Well, let's, let's take somebody that is, um, let's say that they're overweight and they've decided that, you know, hey, you know, I heard karate is a good way to lose weight. Actually, it's not. Um, it's not. There's there's other things that are far more efficient and better to do that. Um, but, you know, that's one of the selling points, you know, lose weight, get in shape. But, well, yeah, I want some of that for six weeks and then I'm going to go back to my chocolate covered sugar bombs in Gilligan's Island. But the the thing is, like, uh, let's say that they come and they say, hey, I want to lose some weight. And uh, the. Uh, you know, so you get out on the floor and you start watching them move and you kind of ask a question here or there and nothing really very intrusive or anything, but something that might just lead to, you know, and you find out that um, actually what's going on is they're under an inordinate amount of stress mm -hmm. from multiple levels. Uh, maybe they've got a job that they just detest, you know. And it's, and it's just pounding on them. So they're finding solace in, you know, carbohydrates and sugars because uh, it's a good blast and it works for a few minutes, you know, and um, or it, it might be, um, you know, too many carbs in those beers or whatever it might be. And so you start to, you start to kind of address that kind of thing. Like you just, you kind of walk by and, and you go, Hey, you ever heard of Vinnie Tortorich? You know, and they're like, no, I don't know who that is. Ah, it's this guy who does this thing. It's called no sugar, no grains. It's really a simple thing. In fact, I, I've been doing it for a while. Um, you can check him out on the web. He's pretty cool. You know, you walk away, you know, and you just start kind of feeding those little things. And pretty soon, you know, it begins to get traction. It's not an overnight. You can't, you can't repair something overnight that may have taken 15 years to get there. So that's just sort of a cursory top line sort of thing. And you could go through the same thing if somebody said, I want to be, I want to be more flexible or, uh, God, you know, I, I'm really scared with the, uh, the, um, uh, environment that's going on in my neighborhood, you know, whatever mm. it might be. And you can, yeah. you can start to, to work that stuff. Yeah. So th that's the way I see it. I don't see it as a motivator. I look at the motivator as actually the, the negative it's the, the, they respond to the negative that brought them in. Most people, there's other people, you know, that come in, it's like, Hey man, I've been training martial arts for 25 years and I just got relocated here and I've heard about you and let's get it on. It's like, great, let's go. You know, that's a whole different deal. Those are the easy ones. Yeah. Those are the fun ones. Yeah. It's like, you know, cause, cause you know that you can, uh, you, you can bump and punch pretty hard and it's going to be fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a good time. It's a whole different day one experience. Yeah. You're, yeah. It's a whole different day different one expectations. Experience. Yeah. Yeah. Now you talked about football when you were younger. You talked about wrestling when you were younger. Mm -hmm. Where did martial arts enter the equation? Oh, before either of those. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. That's not what I would have guessed. No. Um, I, uh, 
this is this is going to I've said this before and it's going to sound really odd, but you'll get it. You know, it just takes a minute to kind of dress it out. Sure. Um, you know, when you're a kid, of course, you're you're incredibly impressionable. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you, you might think that you're, you know, I'm Spider-Man or, you know, or, uh, you know, whatever it is. But when I was a kid, man, at 730 in the evenings, Johnny Quest came on. And Race Bannon could fly any aircraft, shoot any firearm. The girls loved him. He could drive anything. He was always the guy who was the can do, let's save the day. I'm going to grab that rope and come swinging in like Tarzan, yeah. you know, and, and he wore slacks and slip ons, which was just unheard of in my community. Yeah. Just, you know, you wore, you wore slacks when somebody died, right. you know, and, um, and, uh, he knew judo and I was like, yeah, race Bannon. I want to be that guy. I want to be race Bannon. And then it, you know, it, uh, it changed. You could, you could say that it grew or it metastasized, <laughs> yeah, however you want to, <laughs> you know, what you want to shape it. But, uh, you know, then it, then it was like, Oh, Kung Fu came on and it was like, Oh man. And you know, the, the stories of, you know, the, the levels that I had to go to, to, to actually get training and to do it and, you know, just go on and on and on. And, and they're kind of boring in the sense that um, most martial arts that artists who have uh, longevity um, have got a similar story of, um, you know, a journey of uh, burden, loss, reconstruction, you know, all of those yeah. kinds of things. And, you know, I, there's no sense to go into the minutia of it because it, it, I think it's kind of boring, but in a, in a grand scheme of wheel of here's how the process goes. I think, I think anybody that's had any time on the floor of the mat has experienced those things. I, I think so. And I think that the first two aspects of that, the, the burden and the loss, I think we all suffer those aspects, but not everyone gets the opportunity for, um, would you, what word did you use? The rebuild, yeah. you know, to explore that, to get to the other side of that, you know, plenty of people do in plenty of ways that aren't martial arts, but as martial artists, you spend, a you spend that time on the mat, you know, wh whatever, you know, the mat, the floor, whatever you call it, whatever the discipline is. And you can really, you can only go so far before you have to face that stuff. Even if you try to put it aside, you know, if it, whatever it is, it's, it's going to manifest in, you know, your, your inability to remember a form or to handle getting punched in the face or, you know, intense discomfort, whatever it is, it's there and you got to push past it somehow. I got a, I got a text from uh, one of my old students who's now um, going to school at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. And he's like, hey, man, I can't find any goju root because that's what we do, you know. And I'm kind of thinking about maybe doing this or doing that. I'm practicing and I'm afraid my skills are, you know, and he was kind of, and, and I said, hey, um, you know, this is the time. This is the time where most people quit. Yep. And you have reached out. You clearly don't want to go find something that answers this. It could be judo. It could be taekwondo. It could be whatever is available, but find the thing that answers for you and understand that this is what everybody goes through. You've decided to push through, do it. And, uh, you know, I said, go find a big cup and drink from it. And he, and he laughed and he, in the text, he said, ha, I remember you telling me that I wasn't supposed to be a teacup waiting for you to come pour tea in me, mm -hmm. that I was supposed to go find it. He said, I will. You know, and it's like, okay, great. And, and that's part of that journey. He's experiencing some of that loss. He's going to be fine. He's going to come through this and he's going to do, well, how many different arts have you done, Jeremy? A, a bunch. Let, let's say, let's yeah. say a half a dozen, seriously. Right, right. And, and it was like, okay, I'm here now. Uh, this is what I have. And this is what I'm going to do now. Yep. It's, it's not any more complicated than that. But people want to make it complicated and they want to try to recreate that situation that they had when they were. It doesn't exist. It didn't exist when you walked out the door on Monday and went back on Tuesday. <coughs> Excuse me. 
because that's in the past. That moment doesn't exist anymore. You think that it does. And, you know, people walk in and uh, I've experienced this and you have too. And I know this is going to resonate with the listeners. Somebody walks in and goes, hey, uh, what kind of karate is it you do? We do Goju-Ryu. Oh, I do Ishin-Ryu. Well, we're closely related. Yeah, do you guys do Chinto kata? No, we don't do Chinto. Oh, I really like that kata. Yeah, well, you know, I'm not going to say you can't practice it. I mean, please <laughs> feel free. But right. yeah, but I was looking for uh, what 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 I want to say at that point, and I don't say it. And this is a, an odd time that I actually do meter myself. <laughs> I, I say, well, you know, I mean, in my head, what I want to say is quit looking to re create something that no longer exists it's gone go find something new juicy wonderful and be a stud go yeah you know and yeah. um they don't they want to well i put so much time into this well welcome to the sunken cost fallacy just stop that go be big go live your life i i think the idea of having one teacher for the duration of your life is stagnating and I'm not saying that it's in, in, an insult or anything, but people grow, change, and morph. I mean, look, man, you know, uh, everybody's, everybody's world changes. Yeah. As you grow older, your, your palate changes. You it know, should. Ooh, yeah, yeah, I like you who. Well, I used to like you who when I was 11, but now I like black coffee. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> a great example. Yeah. That that Ishinru example, you know, what I find, and, and I'll, I'll tell people this, look, okay, so you had a school that worked really well, you had an instructor you enjoyed, yeah, a, a training man. environment, and you have codified all of that as Ishinru. And if you focus on that too much, you're going to end up, yeah, you'll maybe find another Ishinru school, but the instructor is going to be different, the people are going to be different, the culture is going to be different, and there's a very good chance that what you end up with is a bigger departure from what you had and want than if you go train somewhere else and look for a great instructor, a great culture, great students, you know, whatever. I look at the things that are most important and hone in on those things, not the style. I like the word you used, departure. Mm. I think that's I think that's where you should you should look at it is like where are you standing and where are you going to depart from and what is your trajectory? You know, that's, that's it. I'm big on trajectory. I, I like goals. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm a big goal kind of guy, but I think that, that goals need to remain um, flexible in, in this sort of environment. I mean, I don't think goals are flexible when it comes to, you know, the bottom line of a spreadsheet in regard. Yeah, I, I look at, at martial arts goals like a, a, a cone on a desk. You know, you got your hand on the point and there's that cone and you can kind of roll it back and forth a little bit, you know, and that bigger end is sort of getting towards that. Um, that's what's uh, that that's the way that it should be approached, because then you have an opportunity to um, get as much as you'd like or leave as much as you'd like. Mm -hmm. And that comes back to the individual. I not I'm not a big um, I look at, I look at these, uh, huge organizations, you know, they got like, you know, 500 people on a gymnasium floor for their Gashuku. And that's great. The fellowship, there's a lot of attributes to it that are Absolutely. great, but, but what are you doing? You're just marching up and down the floor and doing key home. You know, you're just doing your basics and marching up and down the floor. I, that, that, that's fine, but you know, no, find find the juice on the edges. It's, it's always in the margins. It's always in the margins. Mm -hmm. It's in the the transition points. Um, you know, it's in the um, the the skinny places, the ineffable places, the 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 transitions between this, you know, between this forest and this marsh. You know, one is a forest and one is a marsh, but that transition place, that's 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 where the juice is. There's some unique stuff there. If you, if you think about environments, there are plants, you know, blackberries, raspberries, which, you know, they're in most of the country. Yeah. yeah. I don't know about outside the U.S., but they tend to grow on edges, edges of roads, right. edges of forests. There's a whole ecosystem of plants and animals that exist on edges. There's, on the edges, yeah. there's substance there. And we tend to think of those lines 
as actual lines that are hard and fast and nothing exists on them. It's one side or the other. And that's not the reality of life. Life is shades of gray. It's, it's in between it's overlap, including yeah, in our trade. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and if we want to get to 21st century about it, it's a Venn diagram. So I love you know. Venn diagrams. <laughs> Who doesn't? <laughs> the best. One, one of my favorite ways to describe things. In fact, I, I've described plenty of things on this show as being Venn diagram intersections. Uh, I, I got a question for you. Okay. Um, if you know you you love your martial arts and you're you're doing, and this is all hypothetical, okay? And um, <laughs> You, in fact, used your martial arts in defense of yourself or your family, and you did it successfully, okay? Mm -hmm. But shortly afterwards, you found out that your instructor that you've been with for several years is actually a fraud, that they made up the entire thing. What do you do? Do you leave or do you stay? This is a great question. And I wish I'd asked it of you. <laughs> so when I think about fraud, in order to be a fraud, you have to misrepresent things. Deliberately. And deliberately. Yeah. And it's if somebody puts together a curriculum that is substantive enough that I'm able to utilize it and defend myself in, in you know whatever vague way that happens, there's some merit there. There's some value. And I'm not a big fan of liars. I'm not a big fan of people who will say something is one thing and it's another. You know, if someone says, I'm teaching you Goju and it's not. Yeah. I'm sure. going to have an issue with that. It's not a huge deal, but I'm going to try to find out why. If someone is a, you know, they earned a blue belt. They never got any higher than that and trained on their own for 20 years and opened a school and they nominate themselves as grandmaster and put a bunch of stripes on their belt. I care what they can teach me. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean I'm okay with it, but there's a lot of nuance and there's a lot of why that I've got to determine whether or not, you know, before I, before I leave. An adroit answer. <laughs> Yeah. What? What's, okay. All you right. know, what, how would you handle that? I would leave. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I would leave. Um, because uh, that, that level of, of deception is um, unacceptable. Hmm. It's just unacceptable. Uh, now you, you kind of uh, changed a few things in there where you said, well, you know, a blue belt, but they trained for 20 years and this kind of stuff. Well, you know, there's there's people that have done that successfully. Absolutely, uh, Masayama did it. You know, I'm, and yeah, I'm not going to argue with Kyokushin Kai. Um, <laughs> you know, so um, yeah, there there are those moments, but uh, I would have to say that it would, I would be I, I'd have to leave because because then I couldn't propagate what had been taught to me. I think it depends on what was fraudulent. You know, there, there, are, there are varying degrees, you know, is if some, there are people in here. Deliberately think, fraudulent. If it's deliberately fraudulent and it is made up of 75% is just made up. You're walking. You're going to walk. Probably. Probably. Yeah. He, here, here's why I think I'm having a hard time coming down hard and fast on that is because at some level, every let's say modern martial arts style, any, everything that, that's come out in the last, you know, 10, 20 years, it's been an amalgamation of other things in the very yeah. same tradition that every art you and I and listeners have trained in, right? They, they were all amalgamations at some point. Somebody that is their contemporary will point at that person and say, you are a fraud. You have no oh, yeah. lineage. You, they, they will, they'll sling all kinds of mud at it. And and I have some sensitivity to that, not because I've done it. Um, I'm sure I've known people that have done it, but because I am very style agnostic and very much a, a free market martial artist. If what you teach works, it works for you. You're happy. Everybody's being uh, treated. And, and this is where what you said becomes relevant fairly, openly, honestly. 
right? Mm-hmm. If things aren't being yeah. misrepresented, it doesn't matter. I don't, I don't care. I don't care what you're doing. If it works for you, do it. The, the fraudulence part, I'm not a big fan of lying. You know, my, my, my integrity, my, my code, my personal code has very few entries on it and lying is one of them. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Now, what agreed. brought that up? Well, I just thought I'd throw a hard, fast one at your head. <laughs> there's some is it is it is it is it the head is the fact that there's no hair there is look like a ball well uh, what you're talking about my luxurious head of hair is that what compared to mine (laughs) compared to okay okay if if we were to draw look i got a little there's a little bit of right there and i i think my hairline would go to about here so okay yeah well that's that's your headphone mark <laughs> that's what it is. It's it's from recording all these years. That's yeah, gotta yeah, be it. Yeah, I, I yeah. think if we were to compare hairlines, you <laughs> your hair is much more luxurious than mine comparatively, my friend. Yeah. That's one of the things I uh I joke with some of the uh younger girls that come in the class, you know, they'll have rubber bands or scrunchies or something, and I'll go, ah, that is so weird. I almost wore my hair like that today. Yeah. <laughs> They're just like, give it up. Yeah. <laughs> For some reason, people with hair never never find uh, not hair jokes to be funny. I don't know what it is. Yeah. Well, at this point in life, you know, it's just uh, it's proper hair management, trying to retain what you want in the right places and, you know, suppress the inappropriate. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think that's all hair always. Yeah, yeah, possibly. Yeah, yeah, possibly. Do, do we do we spend more time, effort, money on anything that really doesn't matter than hair? Um, I mean, we could get into yeah. the psychology of it. It's pretty, it's pretty obvious. It's, you know, it's, it's yeah. putting yourself I, you on know, display I, for others, but you know, we really don't need to. There's I'll no- be calling you, I'll be calling you, uh, uh, late tonight while I can't sleep pondering that. So please do, please do. My phone is always on silence. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, here's a question for you. Okay. If you had a choice just between two diseases and you can only choose one of them, would you would you rather have diabetes or asthma? Diabetes one or two. Ah, we'll go with one. Okay. Uh, and if I'm not mixing them up, type one is born with it. The, the liver failure, yeah. So you're not yeah. getting out of that. Um, so in that case, I'm going asthma. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I've known plenty of people who have conditioned their body to the point where asthma does not have a much of an impact on them. I have met those people as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool mm-hmm. that, that people can do that. And those are really interesting people because they have decided through the force of their will and determination to try to and successfully change their physiology mm-hmm. that's just the coolest thing on the planet love it and and it happens it happens there there are plenty of things like this um like the best example i have out of my genetics my grandmother's tonsils grew back which mm. is not supposed to be able to happen now obviously i wasn't there and i didn't do the surgery so this could be some you know familial tale that's been passed down that wasn't really quite as accurate as it's portrayed but you know there's not a lot of motivation it's not that great of a story this you know it's not like you're saying oh my arm grew back you know but there are things out there you know as martial artists we've witnessed things we participate in things that yeah do at times challenge convention you know one more kick do one more kick at what point do you, yeah. are you not able to do that one more kick? Uh, I just flashed on this uh, this picture, um, and it made me laugh, of uh, just a, 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 a drunk Jeremy in college going, yeah, my grandma's tonsils grew back. <laughs> you know, just out of so, the- So you're, you're, the, you're the, not entirely inaccurate, uh, but the whole <laughs> sentence is, I'm the real world Wolverine. Yeah. Oh well, there. I you don't. Go. I don't have adamantium, but you know, clearly, 
and they regenerate. Uh, yeah, so um, let's remove a toe and see what happens. Let's, I, I, trust me, I've tried plenty of times. How's Tuesday? <laughs> Tuesday's a recording day, not a great day. Yeah. I mean, it, oh, okay. you know, I don't know how well uh, I'll be able to record on, on that much anesthetic. Yeah, <laughs> you don't get any. We're going old school, baby. That's right. Yeah, you know, you talk about that um, that uh, thing. Um, uh, you know, I'm I'm uh, older now, and uh, I was uh, at the dojo the other night, and one of the kids, really a super kid named Alexander, he's he's just a top flight smart kid, mm. and works hard, applies what you say, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And so after class, he comes to me and goes, Sensei. I said, what? And he goes, I'm going to see how many push-ups I can do. And I said, is that a challenge? And he said, yes. And so we got down on the ground and went to it, you know, and, you know, he, he died out at 38, wow. but, um, how old you know, is he? uh, 14. Still pretty darn good. Yeah. Not bad. Push-ups. Not bad, but I crushed him and I threw, you know, because, you know, cause I can, and uh, you kind of you know, have to. Yeah, I kind of have to. So I threw another five on the tail end of it just to prove a point and, sure. you know, mussed his hair and told him to run along. <laughs> you know? there, there was a there was a day I was I was running class. This is way back. I was a teenager at the time and I think I was teaching the kids class. You know, I was probably, let's say, 16, 15, 16. And we're doing uh, kneeling front kicks, you know, so mm-hmm. you step back into a lunge, stand up, throw a front kick. Listeners probably can imagine that if, even if they've never done it. And typically we would do 10, maybe on a rough day, we would do 20. And so I declared, we're going to go until everybody taps out. And there was one really stubborn kid at the front of the line. And he was, he just, he wasn't backing down and I'm dying. I'm absolutely dying. I'm like, I'm going to fall over. I'm not going to be able to do adult class. My legs aren't going to work anymore. And I think we got up to 50 on each side. Wow, that's and it was the only reason I, I was able to keep going is because I had to. Yeah. Because I put out a challenge and you know, as as the senior student, I couldn't look like I didn't deserve that spot. Now, obviously when I'm older now, yeah. you know, my, my ego is a little bit more uh a little more resilient. And but but there there's good. there's something to that. There's something to be to being put on the spot. Yeah. And, you know, that's the question is, um, uh, I I learned this, you know, you talk about being, being put on the spot. Um, Years ago, when the Buffalo Bills football team was on their major run, you know, four consecutive Super Bowls, their coach was Marv Levy, uh, who was a very well-read, intelligent man. And I, this just stuck with me. And, um, they would huddle up, you know, just before they were ready to break for the kickoff and he'd give them their last couple words. And he would always say, men, where would you rather be than right here, right now? Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, absolutely. Where would I rather be? I'd rather be here trying to do 52 of these, you know? Yeah. I would rather be here. And, And that's the question that, uh, I think people should ask themselves oftentimes in not just their martial arts, but just in life, where would I rather be than right here, right now? If there's an answer, well, maybe you should be there. Hmm. People, uh, they create stress in their lives by doing things like saying, uh, oh, you know, I wish I wasn't at work. I was, I wish I was doing this instead you know i wish i was with my family doing this instead or you might be home with the family going oh man i really ought to be at the office getting that project done just don't do that just don't create that anxiety just do what marv levy said where would you rather be than right here right now if you don't have an answer for that if you do have an answer for that you should seek go that. Do that thing yeah you should go do that thing and um you know, what, what will happen is, is that as you go through that process, you'll start actually uh, drawing boundaries in your world. 
And when people cross over into that boundary, making a demand on you for something that you would not want to do, you're able to measure it more accurately mm -hmm. and to say, I choose not to, you know, I know it's going to sting. I know it's going to hurt, but this is a better choice or vice, you know, whatever it might be. And so, you know, that's the question. Where would you rather be than right here, right now? I'd rather be sitting in the stands watching my kid play this sport than anywhere else. You know, yeah, but I, I thought we were going to have Saturday class, not this Saturday, mm. you know, because Saturday class, in my experience, has been kind of an afterthought for a lot of people, mm -hmm. you know, oh, it's, there's it's nothing Saturday. else worth doing. They'll show right. up. There's, they'll show up. Well, no, you know, well, guess what? Today, yeah, but I was really counting on it. Well, I'll see you next Saturday. You, you can know, still train right? on your own. Yeah, there's nothing stopping you. Um, and so having the boundaries in life, I would suggest to people that one of the ways to, to really begin to establish boundaries in your own world for you to navigate the, the, the scope that is our lives is to just simply say, where would I rather be than right here, right now? Hmm. What's your why? You've been training a long time. I was mm -hmm. teaching mm -hmm. quite a few of those year, years. Yeah. And, you know, you're just talking about balance. And obviously, this is something that you think about. So you, when you get to the dojo and you have a class for the thousandth time over the however many years, it's still a place that you would rather be at yes. least most of the time. And so the question is why? I think it's my responsibility. Hmm. Uh, I take it as a responsibility and not a burden. Um, it's a responsibility and um, I'm pretty good at it. I'm pretty good at it. I've honed my skills constantly growing and evolving and changing and developing and, you know, and, and, and I should, and I think we all should. Um, but it goes back to, uh, sort of a, a strange, it's, it's not a strange, I sh I shouldn't say that it goes back to a code of ethics mm -hmm. that I think that you should leave when you go to a picnic in the park, you should leave it better than you found it. You know, um, yeah, it's not my trash. So what pick it up. And those kinds of behaviors make for a better society. And when you have a better society, you have better families. And when you have better families, you have better individuals. And karate or the martial arts, doesn't make any difference if it's a judo or tai chi or whatever it is, is an internal discipline. So to work that schedule the other way, from society, family, individual, to work it from individual, family, society. That's the, that is the underlying aspect of what tethers us to one another and builds an opportunity for us to be better people, to leave it better than we found mm -hmm. it. Martial arts, karate, judo has done that for me. It has broadened my horizons and both the vertical and horizontal axis. And that, if I can open that door and allow somebody to just step through and take a breath and go, oh, now I can go this way or that way. Mm -hmm. And all of these kinds of things will make for the better individual. You know, the, the, the best laws in any society are not ones that come down from on high, but they're ones that the community has decided are a pretty good idea. And then the government codifies them and mm. says, this is how we should operate this. Yeah. And that's the way that I look at martial arts, except not in the concept of laws, but in the concept of building individuals that have uh, integrity and that indomitable spirit that you're talking about, you know, doing those 50 lunge kicks and, you know, going and doing those kinds of things and finding that your parameters are larger than you thought they were or were even told they were. Yeah. 
And it all happens at the individual level. And I do not know. There, there must be something out there. But I don't know anything that has the ability to transfer those qualities in such a way than martial arts. And so, agree. yeah, and, and I mean, you know, hey, look, you, you throw a great javelin, that's a solo sport. It's an, it's an, it's a solo discipline. Well, so is karate. Yeah, it is, but you know what? Throwing the javelin is a solo discipline with a solo participation. Martial arts is a solo endeavor set in a group atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And you know, as well as anybody, um, if, if you and I had never met and we crossed hands on the floor, we're going to know each other's tone, heart, timber, direction, and intent in five seconds. Yep. And you're going to know whether you want to be around me or not. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know? So, you know, that's one of the qualities that martial arts have. Now, you asked a very short question, why? That's a long answer. But My favorite it, kind. It, it, it comes down to a phrase. I took, I took all of that and I condensed it down. I decided I needed to condense it down to just a simple mission statement, a personal mission mm -hmm. statement. And mine is to help people find things in themselves they may not know existed. I like and that's, that. And that's my, that's my, that's my motto. That's my charge. And I don't want to make it sound like I'm coming down on high with the tablets wrapped in robes or anything. I'm just saying that if, if the time is appropriate and I have an opportunity and I have the ability, then I should. I think only people who have never, people who haven't spent much time training or people who have not been instructors might find fault with that. Anybody who's spent time at the front of the room knows that, you know, yeah, you could describe it differently, but that is a very apt description for what goes on in the conveyance of martial arts to students. If you're not showing them things that they didn't know were there, are they growing? No. And if your students aren't growing, you're not a very good instructor because that's Agreed. the goal. Yeah, absolutely. You, you've got to help them find those aspects of who they are. My definition of martial arts involves the words personal development. There's got to be that growth. And without it, it's a dance. We're just dancing. You know, I agree. And, um, you know, my, you know, that, you know, that drill that you go through, like, you, you know, you're working for a company or something like, you know what, we're going to do a team building skill. We're not talking about the trust fall, but you know, it's like, uh, you know, we want you to write your own epitaph. You know, what, what, what's going in the paper? What's your epitaph? You know, so you write it and it's like, I did this, I did that, you know, this kind of stuff. And um, I thought it was, um, I thought it was a rudimentary drill that was condescending and I didn't like it. <laughs> I'm not surprised. <clears throat> yeah. I'm sure you told someone. Um, yeah, I think I probably <laughs> did. Um, but uh, the, but I thought about it and I said, well, wait a minute, you know, instead of just discounting this, what at, let's, let's, let's reshape this and see if we can find some value in it. So I did reshape it and it was, um, you know, whoever happens to come to my funeral and they're standing at the side of the grave, whatever, you know, permutation that takes, what are they going to say? My goal and i don't i'm not a big believer in hope i don't like hope i don't i don't like it hope means that you've exhausted what you think are all of your opportunities and, and actions and your hope is not a plan um i don't hold the word in high regard uh i trust that i have done a good enough job that every person standing around that grave would say I was better for having walked through the door of that dojo. Didn't say how, right. I'm better. That would be my goal because then that feeds that, that larger 
uh, diatribe that I went into about, yeah. you know, the, the, the status of people within, you know, society and community and individualism and so forth. Um, that's, that's the thing to, to push it forward. Um, what was your great grandfather's name? I don't know. Exactly. But yet you carry his genetics. Mm. You carry some of his behaviors and both genetic behaviors and learned and traditionally passed down. You just don't even know it. Yeah. The question is, were those good things? That he sent your way or were they not hmm. you know so hopefully hopefully yeah good ho you see you're using that word i like that word i don't have the same opinion <laughs> of that word <laughs> we could probably do a whole episode on that word <laughs> I, bet, I bet we could because yeah. to me no i'm not even going to go there because then it, it's we're going to get really sidetracked. Okay. So let's, let's continue in the vein of forward thinking, you know, mm -hmm. looking ahead, you know, not, not so far that you're gone, but time, you know, you carry, as you put it, the responsibility of your school of being able to pass down martial arts to the next generation of helping foster these people who walk through the door and hoping trusting to make their lives better right right yeah does that have an end point for you no no um <clears throat> I, I i've told this story and i'll tell it again uh, my judo instructor kenji yamada was a was an interesting man he was complicated like many people but he was also um just a demon on mm. the on the mat and uh and he had died and I was in the uh, Yadansha locker room with one of the guys, Bo. Bo had trained with him since he was five. Mm -hmm. And Bo and I are standing there. Now, we both knew this guy, and he had an enormous impact on both of us in many different kinds of ways. And I turned and I looked at the pegboard where people hang their belts and their geese and stuff. And I said, Bo, look at that. And it was Sensei Yamada's red and white belt hanging there. And he and Bo said he was coming back. And I said, yeah. And that's the way that I think it should be done. I I believe, you know, and 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 to be perfectly frank, you know, towards his later years, he was serving in more of an executive capacity. Sure. But that didn't mean that his knowledge had diminished, you know, in any way. It was just that his body was not what it was. Okay, fine. Um, but, you know, do you, do you want to, do you want to be a flashlight inadvertently left on on the kitchen counter and fade away? Or would you rather be that candle that flickers and then is gone? I'd much rather be that candle. And so the, the martial arts, um, I don't see an end to it for me. There, there will be an end because there is, you know, a termination of the mm -hmm. physical. That will happen. But, um, you know, uh, hey, I just crushed a, I just crushed a teenager in push-ups the other day. So, you, know. <laughs> you got some time. <laughs> I got some time, and um, you know, I, I realize externally that my art has changed because of my, my age. Um, I'm still, uh, you know, I'm still in pretty good shape. I'm, you know, I'm 60 and, uh, I can, I, I can go at it. I can have at it. Um, that's not a problem. Uh, but I'm also a lot smarter about it. You know, um, uh, we went to, uh, we went and had a, a visit with another dojo a while back and, uh, the head instructor started going through some, uh, traditional karate warm-ups of which I have sort of discarded because of my time with uh, physicians and physiologists and so forth and some of the things you know are just sure. not acceptable anymore but he was you know going through that and a couple of my brown belts were in the back you know and I was kind of up in the front and I'm doing my thing and and you know I kind of busted him 
and afterwards we were kind of, we were sitting around talking and, and they go, God, that was hard. You know, and I go, okay. Yeah. And they said, uh, you, you didn't, your, your face didn't change, man. You didn't look like you were working hard. Well, that's just age in a good way. I know what's coming. I know how long this is going to be. I know what we're going to do. I'm able to meter myself. Mm -hmm. I'm able to do what needs to be done. This is all new to that. They're just, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's a, it's a big energy expense. And for me, it's just like, okay, I've done this a thousand times and I'm going to do it a thousand one. Nothing to prove. Nothing to prove. Um, But, you know, there is that. uh, And, and I, and I have to say that um, I was really thinking about this the other day. Because I, I used to think this way, I'd say, can I beat, could, could I beat myself today at, you know, could I beat my 30 year old self? And the answer is, yeah, yeah, I could, because I'm smarter. I'm smarter. I'm still, you know, I'm not what I was when I was 30. I mean, that's just, that's immutable. Um, but still got, still got some, some gas in the tank and I'm still feeling pretty good. I don't really have any pain in my body to speak of for all of the injuries that I've had. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I, I think I would, I think I'd give my younger self a pretty good go and I don't think it would last very long. Hmm. Um, and uh, so, you know, that's sort of one of those things where you sort of measure stuff in your, in your mind. I, I fought my last open judo tournament and open means all comers, mm-hmm. you know, uh, at 40, I was fighting guys that were 20, 21, you know, and, uh, and, uh, it was, it was cool. It was cool. Yeah. Sounds fun. Sounds like a good time. But I'm, wa- I'm walking into the, <clears throat> into the mat and there's this one guy that we always wound up like in the quarterfinals, seeing each yeah. other, this guy's Ron, you know, Ron and I were always seeing each other, you know, and, um, and I never lost to Ron but it was, it was always close. And so I'm walking into this tournament, that last tournament, and I got my bag and Ron's standing there in a, uh, in a uh, blue blazer and a white shirt and a blue tie. You know? And I go, Ron, what's up with that? And he goes, I'm reffing. And, and he looks at my duffel bag and he goes, what's up with that? And I go, I'm fighting. <laughs> you know, and, and he shook his head at me and I shook my head at him. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. Uh, yeah, there, there's there's an attitude that, you know, I've I've heard from some of the, you know, longest functioning people, not not just in martial arts, but just in general. Just, you know, the moment you stop acting like a kid, the moment you stop being curious and asking why and being a pain in the butt and doing all these childlike things, you start to fade. And if that's the case, then. I'm going to be in good shape for a very long time. Yeah. And, I'm still know, a major pain in the butt. I get the sense that you have remained. I mean, you kind of described yourself as yeah. such at the top of the show. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, but you know what? I'll tell you, it's, it's, you know, so, so like, let's, let's take today. Hmm. Uh, this morning I got up at five fifteen. Um, you know, did a little bit of work on the computer and everything. Then my timer went off and now it's time for me to do my, uh, my Wim Hof protocols. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I do my, I do my breathing, I hit the cold shower and then uh, I do a wall sit. Uh, You know, uh, you know, do you bend your legs, you sit Mm -hmm. down, you know, you know, and, and that, and so then, and and I have various cycles and I track all this stuff on my, um, on my spreadsheet. And so sometimes it's, uh, sometimes it's the DMT breathing. Sometimes it's, um, how many Hindu squats can I do on an empty breath? How many pushups can I do on empty breath? Um, what is the new yoga pose I'm going to challenge myself with? Mm. And I don't go through like a whole, uh, you know, yoga protocol. It's like, I got this big book, I flip it open and I go, damn, that looks like a bitch. I'm gonna try that. <laughs> you know? And, and, um, you know, so that's part of that, that you talk about that youthful enthusiasm. It's like, yeah, what do you got? You know? Um, and I, I got into the Hoff breathing, um, maybe six or seven years ago, maybe it was seven. And, uh, I downloaded 
big as PDF and all of this kind of stuff. And then one of my students says, hey, man, Hoff's going to be in Vancouver, BC. It's like, yeah, let's go, you know. So talking about being on the edges, we showed up early, deliberately, because this is the time, you know. And sure enough, I got some time with him, nice. you know, and, and got to talk and, uh, uh, you know, very cool. And I got to I got to really see if he was what I thought he was. And he was 100 yeah. percent. Yeah. Uh, Anybody who's who's listening who doesn't know who Wim Hof is, check this guy out. And here's the thing. If this is the first time you're hearing about him, you're going to do a little bit of research and you're going to think there's no way. There's no way this guy is legit. But the, the best test I've seen documented, and apparently this, this you can find this, he is so, he has so much faith in what he does that he's been injected with E. coli. Yeah, yeah, they did that in Denmark. And he was fine. And, and I think it was 12 control. He had 24, 12 control, 12 had learned how to, and, and all of the 12 that had done his breathing threw off the E. coli. Yep. Yeah. Um, no, that's it, pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I, I let me tell you a story. I, I got, I had a detached retina because mm. of judo, you know, oddly enough. <laughs> And uh, so I go in to get it fixed and they prep me for surgery. And the nurse says, well, it's going to be, you know, about 40 minutes for the, you know, you need it. Not I'm good. Goes the screen. She leaves me in there. Well, I'm hooked up to all of the machines that go ping and everything. And I thought, well, you know, I'm here. I got, I'm, I'm hooked up. Let's give it a go. Mm. And um, I don't know, probably about four or five minutes later, the curtain flips open and the nurse goes right to the machine. And she goes, are you okay? And I go, yeah, I'm fine. And she goes, your heart, your heart rate set off our alarm. And I go, what is it? She said, 41. And I went, oh, okay. And she goes, are you doing that on purpose? And I said, yeah. And she goes, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I go, you want me to bring it back? And she said, yeah. And I went, okay. So I brought it back and she watched the numbers come back up. And she goes, that sets off our alarm at the nurse's desk. Don't do that anymore. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Now, did you do it again? Because I, no. I would have a hard time not. No, I, you know, at that point I acquiesced to the authority and went, all right. Well, they were going to do surgery on you. I guess it's yeah. a good idea yeah. to stay in there. They're, yeah. Stay favorable. Um, but it, you know, the Hoff stuff, and I've done a lot of things. I'm, mm. cause I'm always exploring stuff. I mean, I've, I've done just tons of things that are, some of them are really out there. I've done some real out there stuff. Um, you know, uh, I remember one New Year's, we went down to a lake and we walked into the lake and broke the ice with our bodies, just a thin sheet of ice, you know, yep. in this little lake, some would call it a pond. But uh, we walked out there on New Year's morning, breaking the ice, went up to our necks, did Sanchin Kata, and then walked back out. and. What happened was, is, is I remember this so clearly, Jeremy, I was like, I'm walking out of here. And I start and I turned when I was done and I started walking and several other people started to run out of the lake. And Sensei yelled at him, he said, walk, you know, and they stopped. And it was like, yeah, that's right. You walk, you don't run from this, you right. walk from it, you know, um, and so, you know, lots of things. I'm a, I'm a huge, huge believer in Hoff. Um, I've, I've had some incredible experiences um, with it, uh, some major successes, um, just, just great stuff, you know. Nice. Um, and so, you know, I, I do those things. Uh, I was, I'll, I'll tell you this, uh, I, you know, bulletproof coffee, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm a big believer in that too. And uh, so, uh, but I built my own little concoction. I just kind of, it's a cold version of it. Mm -hmm. So what I can do is I can use it like at a seminar. So, so um, I, I'm in England and uh, Ian Abernathy had brought me over and we were doing a double team. He'd do the first hour, I'd do the next, we'd go like this, you know? So um, I said, well, in the, tomorrow morning when you come pick me up, you know, I said, we'll get that, we'll, we'll, I'll show you how to put that stuff together that um, we bought at the store. 
you know. So I make up this elixir for him, you know, and we we chug it down and I go, you're good for the day, baby. You're good. And he's like, really? Really, mate? You sure? Yeah. I was like, yeah, yeah. So um, about three o'clock in the afternoon, he comes up to me and he goes, stuff's amazing. And I was like, yeah, it is. And he goes, yeah, it's amazing, you know. So he goes, you got to get me, the, you got to get me the recipe. Well, it involves about three tablespoons of instant coffee. And uh, he uh, sends me this email and he goes, hey, uh, would you send me the formula again? So, so I actually drew pictures of this is, goes to this, this goes to that. He's like, mm -hmm. oh, I can follow that. And he goes, um, that explains something. And I go, what? And he said, I used like seven. <laughs> <laughs> like, and he was no, up for no. like two days. <laughs> and his comment was he got a lot done <laughs> but uh but you know but but you know and i tell that story on ian um but when you get to a certain place you know you start getting into those uh realms of challenging and exploring and finding what works and um, i'm sure that you have done similar things you're like you know hey i'm Think I'm falling a little short here. What's out there that might uh, right. remediate this? What might fix this? What might even prevent a, a band aid? Because that's all I need for a short time. So what 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 have you what have you done that uh, would be considered sort of uh, out there and a little bit wacky that uh, has put you on the floor longer, better, and more vibrantly? Uh, well, the number one thing is I refuse to acknowledge my age. Oh, and yeah, not but, not in the sense that I, I won't tell people. I mean, I turn 42 next month. Oh, I remember 42. I don't I don't look in the mirror and see 42. I know I don't act yeah. 42. Uh, nobody th seems to think I'm 42. I mean, I've got a couple white spots in my in my beard, you know, but that's that's about it. Uh, mm -hmm. I am in the best shape of my life. Mm -hmm. And so how, how do I how do I do that? It's constantly testing and revising the things that I do, you know, like here's a big one. First thing I do when I get out of bed, other than, you know, hit, hit the bathroom, big glass of water. Mm -hmm. Raises your metabolism. I throw a little bit of salt in it. Uh, and it... Are you using uh, non-iodized? Are you, are you just using regular table salt? Uh, it's Himalayan salt. Okay, I was going to say, you're going with the... Okay, in a jar, keep going, keep going. sits yep. in the sunlight, you yep. know, tons of water, yep. you know. We, yeah. we, we, I get the sense that we run in a lot of the same kind of alternative health circles. You know, I've done the bulletproof sure. coffee thing. Um, I try to save my carbs for dinner. You know, not that I'm militant about that. Uh, magnesium. Actually, we, we've got a book that we're, we're working on that is some of the things that I do organized into a really simple 12 month, you know, each month you add a new simple thing you know like the glass of water is the first month like build that habit right right you know the yeah. the, the benefits of a i what have you discarded what have you tried and then just said no and discarded and why i'm not as big on intermittent fasting as i was i will use yeah, it periodically yeah. but there was probably a two-year period where i was really big on that and It just, it didn't, it didn't work for me. Now it doesn't mean it doesn't work for people, but it didn't work for me. Um, the other thing, I think the biggest thing, my biggest kick right now is separating movement from exercise. The distinction between yeah. what, what, I mean, think of it as walking or whatever it is, the difference between expending calories when in a parasympathetic state versus a sympathetic state, I believe in the next 10 to 20 years will be a huge research area in science and something that we will say, aha, this is a thing. We lumped it all together and we shouldn't have. Boy, I agree with you on that. I, I agree with you on that. Um, yeah, you know, the, I, the intermittent fasting thing didn't really resonate with, with me either. And I, it, this is just me talking. Uh, yeah. I'm suspicious that it has to do with, you know, mesomorph versus ectomorph, endomorph. Um, I have a tendency to believe that, and, and I, I forget what the Arabic terms are. They're like Pitta and I think Veda, but 
um, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer that there's, that there's certain things that simply do not resonate with your body because sure. of your genetics and your structure. Um, the, um, you know, th there's, there's foods that I just don't have no business mm -hmm. being around. It doesn't work. It, it kicks my butt. You know, you know, what'll happen is that, um, like if I eat a, a, a McDonald's hamburger and now I, I, I know what we're saying here, but you get the picture. Sure. I eat a McDonald's hamburger, my knees and my hips hurt and my nose runs. That ought to be a signal that I'm not stopping at the golden arches anymore. Right. It's your body saying, Hey, I don't want this. Yeah. I don't want this. And so you know, for me, the big kick is it, right now for me is to actually get more protein than I really think that I should have to satisfy me. Yep. Um, and, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of people walking around protein deficient. And we, you know, we can get all into that. But, you know, you're talking about that that glass of uh, water in the morning. That's cool. I'm going with the bulletproof coffee with protein in it and i've got a, a really clean protein that i use called the uh, yarrow j-a-r-r-o-w i've heard of it i haven't i haven't yeah used it. it it is it is amazing stuff and nice. i've been through a pile of proteins over the course of my years this does not cause any uh bloating or nice. distension or anything it's just super clean um then i'll follow with the glass of water because you know why i am a caffeine achiever. I use it. And when I when I'm getting ready to be creative, I'll actually build my day where I know that I don't have anybody that I really have to interact with or anything. I'll build my day. And so like on a Saturday evening, you might catch me at six o'clock having a triple espresso mm. because I'm getting ready to go in because everybody's doing their Saturday night stuff. Yep. They're going to leave me alone. I can put the music on in the background. I, and that caffeine kicks in and I can be really creative for a long time. Yep. And then I'm done. Do you ever yeah. use theanine with your caffeine? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I take it in capsule. Okay. Um, I just take it in capsule. Um, I have, I've played with a lot of different things. Yeah. Um, but I stick with that, uh, L-glutamine, I use that, mm -hmm. and I use um, a pretty high dosage of D3. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm into the, um, I don't know the technical name of it, but I'm into the uh, broccoli sprout extract now. And I can't remember exactly okay. what it's called. Okay, um, yeah, it's, it's ringing a bell. I've, I've caught some stuff on some, you know, yeah. some of the, the, the not quite dirty heavy podcasts that I, I spend time with. And they, they've talked about it, but I haven't, I haven't gone down the rabbit hole. The woman that turned me on to it was the woman, I, she, I believe she's a PhD from Stanford uh, and a surfer, uh, but she was the only person years ago that I found on the web that could actually physiologically and biochemically explain how the Wim Hof method worked. Mm. It wasn't by guess and by golly. It was like, this receptor does this, that, okay. that that co2 level cuts this off and doesn't allow the bonding and blah 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 it's like okay well she starts talking about the broccoli extract and it's like yeah your your work's solid i'm in <laughs> so yeah okay. well let, let's start to wind down here because i i know if we don't put a pin in this here we can there's still a sun in the day there's still there, sun in the there sky. is can... there is well i you 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 may have noticed you know, I was, I had my phone, I was averting my eyes a little bit. I, I, I got us another 15 minutes because oh, I, okay. I know we've got some stuff that we're, we're going to chat about after, but I had a 4.30. Oh. I didn't expect you to go this long. And, and I mean that in the best possible way. <laughs> you know, you're not, you're not at Patrick McCarthy level who holds the record on our show of 3.45, but this, this is, this has been great. So let's, let's do the stuff that we got to do. Let's do the housekeeping stuff. If sure. people want to find you. Where are they going? Uh, Chriswilder.com, K-R-I-S-W-I-L-D-E-R.com. Uh, you can always reach me at Chris Wilder at Chriswilder.com. 
Uh, and, um, you know, if you want to uh, explore some, now Chris Wilder is the portal that'll take you into the mm -hmm. podcasts and, you know, the, the teachable, the online courses and so forth. Um, you know, I have a, I have a set uh, called Brutally Simple, Simply Brutal. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it breaks down um, applications in uh, Kata with uh, everything from anatomical sketches to flows of power and, you know, responses and all of that kind of stuff. Um, because um, <clears throat> I think the world deserves that instead of some of the hokumano that's been pushed out there. Sure. And, uh, and I'm not the purveyor of all that's right and true, but, uh, you know, if you want to go check it out, you can preview everything and there's a nice. 30 mount guarantee, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but there's some free information there too. Like, uh, you know, there's plans on how to build a Makawara, including an indoor Makawara, should you want to build one. Um, and, and some other things like that, but, but essentially chriswilder.com is the portal That'll get you into uh, the podcast, the blog, the newsletter, the um, the teachable, uh, the uh, Twitter, Instagram, um, Facebook is kind of more of a familial oriented mm -hmm. type thing for me. But yeah, chriswilder.com or chriswilder at chriswilder.com. Easy. Yeah. I, I'm I hope sure so. that we're going to have you back because... You know, I don't think we even scratched the surface and, and, you know, listeners, you could tell that there was a little bit more of a back and forth than, than we typically have on a interview episode. And that's fun for me, you know, and it's because, you know, you've done, you've done what I'm doing. And, and so your desire to, to not talk about yourself is, is probably similar to my desire to not talk about myself. And that turns into a conversation and that makes it a lot of fun. You know, it, it's, it's kind of funny. You know, you talk about talking about yourself. Um, I, I, there's a lot of people that claim that I'm a, a, an extrovert, but uh, but it, I, I think it's really, you know, that Venn diagram we were talking about, I think it's gradations. But uh, my friend, Rory Miller, which if you haven't had him on the podcast, get him on the Absolutely. podcast. Uh, Rory, Rory declared that I was the most extroverted introvert he'd ever met. So <laughs> Quite a compliment coming from him. Yeah, he, um, we, he refused to... When we had him on, it was back before. Oh, you did have him on. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, this was a few years ago. This was before he was the first person that adamantly refused to be referred to in any sort of title. You know, he's yeah. like, call me Rory. I was like, how about Mr. Nope, Rory. Rory. Yes, sir. No, yeah. Rory. No, Rory. <laughs> Got it, Rory. <laughs> he's a good dude. Uh, I, I want to tell you a real quick yeah. uh, Rory yeah, Miller story. Um, I was I was talking to him um, a while back. I think this was maybe a year or two ago or something. Now you know he stayed at my house. I've stayed at his. Mm -hmm. We know each other. You know, I mean, we we rolled. We we go back a long nice. way. And um, it, I was talking to him on the phone, and he goes, "Yeah, we found a we found a uh, a body in the house." It's like what, you know, um, because it's Rory. He, you don't know what that means, you know, and it's like, what, you know, because they've lived in this house for 25 years. And I said, well, well, well wait a minute, you got to back that out, man. And he goes, well, you know, he goes, you know, that that little cabinet that's sort of above the vent above the stove, you know, and everything. And I go, yeah. And he goes, well, you know, he goes, we found somebody's ashes tucked away back in a sort of a little cubby hole. And I'm like, OK, uh, name. Nope, no name. Uh, what about the previous owners? No, nope, they never said anything. Like, okay. I, he goes, yeah, we got to figure out what to do with these uh, human remains. I'm like, all right. <laughs> but but there's a typical day in the life of Rory Miller. We found a body in our house. <laughs> I, I I think it, the we have to figure out what to do with these human remains. I think that should be the title of a, a, a book he should write. I don't oh. know what the substance is, but yeah, well, you New know, people could get away with that title. He could. Yeah, we have to just, yeah, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a good one. And that, and that's, that's a fun game to play too, is to come up with book titles and then try to write mm. a book behind it, you know? Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that's the, the fun Rory Miller story. And there's a few others, but we, you sure. know, we'll, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll have Rory Miller day or something. Have, 
get yeah. back together. We'll we'll roast Rory. The roast of Rory <laughs> Miller. He will he will not find it pleasant. Uh <laughs> because 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 it's you're talking about him and he doesn't like that. Right. That's the part he will find him uh, un, unpleasant. Um all right. Well, what else do we need to uh, the, the, wrap up the today? last we, thing as we as we go to the outro. I yeah. ask everybody to give some parting words, you know, and then I'll record an outro later. So what are your parting words to the audience? Hmm. I would have to say my parting words would be do not live your life by convention. Question, be responsible, but don't live your life by convention. Question, be responsible, own it, but don't live by convention. Wasn't that a great conversation? Great episode. I really want to thank Chris for coming on the show for just being the awesome guy that he is. We're talking about doing some stuff on the side stuff that I am sure if we can get some momentum behind it, not only are you going to hear about it, but it's going to be awesome because he's a good dude. Thanks for coming on the show, Chris. And thank you to all of you for watching. Now, if the work that we do here at Whistlekick means something, you know, help us out, support us, contribute, Patreon, reviews, books, tell people, any of that stuff works. And of course, if you want to go deeper on this episode, check out the links, the transcript, which, you know, runs a little bit behind, but they come up fairly soon. You can go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And don't forget, we've got some training programs, whistlekickprograms.com. We've got a program that'll help you get stronger. We got one that will help you get faster. We've got one that will help make you better conditioned for a competition or maybe a testing, some kind of event. So go check those out there. They're far more affordable than you would think. And you need virtually no equipment. Some of them you need, you need literally no equipment. So check those out. If you have feedback, topic suggestions, guest suggestions, just you want to tell us we're doing a great job. You can email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. I appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you for your time today. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.